Jeopardy in a new series. Two or three weeks ago, I preached on uh, uh, the Ten Commandments, and we called it uh, There's Only Ten. Right? So the series now is called There's Only Ten. I know. Where do I come up with these amazing words, right? So we are jumping into a new series. We're going to be focusing on the Ten Commandments, and it's called There's Only Ten. So let's open up our Bibles. Let's go to Exodus chapter 20. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 6. We're going to tackle the first two commandments today. So Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. And while you're doing that, turn to your neighbor or the person behind you in front of you and say, Jesus looks good on you today. All right, Exodus chapter 20. It's actually the second book of the Bible. And so if you got it, say amen. amen. If you need a minute, say give me a minute. Wonderful. Let's stand as we read God's word today. Um, that's what we do to honor God's word. We're going to be reading 1 through 6 today. <clears throat> and I'm coming from the Christian Standard Bible. Starting off with this. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. Do not have other gods besides me. Do not make an idol for yourself, whether in the shape of anything in the heavens above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow and worship to them and do not serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for, their, for the father's inequity to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing faithful love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. So Heavenly Father, we just come to you right now and we praise you and thank you, God, for your word. Your mighty word, your powerful word. Father, we're asking God that today we can continue on in our worship and in, uh, in, in your word as we study it together. And Father, I pray, God, that you, all the words that come out of my mouth are not mine, but be yours. So, Father, open up our uh, eyes so that we can see your word more clearly. And open up our ears so we can hear your word more clearly. And open up our hearts so we can feel your word more clearly. God, we sure do love you. We just thank you, God, for what you're going to do in this moment. And we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As you sit down, turn to three people and say, there's only one God. There's only one God. There's only one God. There's only one God. He's number one. Yeah. you believe that? There's only one God. Yes, sir. Yes. When I was in high school and college, I had an issue. I had a problem. You see, I had this lead foot when it came to driving. In fact, I would get pulled over for speeding all the time. In fact, one time, my freshman year in college, my buddy was going to Independence, Kansas uh, College there, and I was on my way to pick him up during uh, Christmas break. As I'm driving there, I'm actually, now this is back when uh, radar detectors, I don't even know if they're popular anymore or not. I don't have them. Um, but uh, so I didn't have one, but I, a guy passed me that had one. So I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to follow that guy, right? And we're just, we are, we are hauling. And so a police officer pulls up next to me, and he points and tells me to pull over. I was like, oh, man. Well, then he goes and pulls over the next guy in front of me, right? So he says, hey, do you know how fast you're going? I was like, not as fast as that guy. And uh, <laughs> so he says, hey, I'm going to give you a ticket. And I was like, yeah, well deserved. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you. Um, I didn't say all those things, right? But, uh, so I get my car, and now I'm like, you know, I'm going to follow. I'm going to follow the rules. And so I'm driving, and I get pulled over again 100 miles down the road. I get pulled over again, and he says, hey, you know, you were speeding. And I was like, no way. I showed him the ticket. I was like, I just got pulled over 100 miles an hour, uh, 100 miles ago. Your buddy did it. Uh, you know, and I, I haven't even left Kansas, man. I'm in Kansas. And so... And so, long story short, what I found out was is that I put some rims on my car, but I made, I got bigger rims, uh, and so it made my car seem like the speedometer's not right. So he gives me a warning, right? Whew, thank you, Lord. I pick up my buddy Justin. We finally come back home. We're in Longmont, Colorado. His mom and uh, sister are following us, and we stop in Longmont to get gas. And it's like ten o'clock at night, and I'm super tired. And so uh, I'm getting ready to turn onto the highway. So, and I like just turned red, so I stopped, 
And have you ever know, you like look over and you see the light, this light turn green, and you're like, oh, it's time for me to go. Have you ever done that? <laughs> some of you are like, yeah, some of you are like, don't even say it. <laughs> that was me. I turned, even though it was red, and the cop, there was a cop right in front of me. And so he pulled me over, and I was like, you gotta be getting this is three strikes in your mouth kind of stuff. You know what I'm saying? So I go over the whole story. Sir, I have to pay this ticket in Kansas. Here's my warning. Can you please just let me get off, right? That's what I was hoping for. I didn't say that, but that's what I was hoping for. And luckily, somebody sped by us like craziness. He's like, I gotta get that guy. He's like, yes, you do. And he gave me a ticket, right? <coughs> So I, man, I'll tell you what, uh, Trudy and I, we got married in 1998. It was hard for us to get insurance because of me. It was crazy. But let me tell you something. I am now the kind of guy that follows the rules. You've got to be following the rules, right? So the speed limit says that it is 75 miles on the highway, unless you're going somewhere else and it says 80. But the speed limit says 75, and if you go over the speed limit, Right? You're going to get pulled over. You're going to get pulled over for, for breaking the law. Now, I do believe that there is some kind of leniency when it comes to speeding, right? Uh, I think that if you're going 78, you won't get pulled over. I think that if you're going 80, you won't get pulled over. How do I know? Because that's as fast as I go, as I go 80 miles an hour, okay? If a police officer on the highway passes you by at 80 miles an hour, I'll click it to 81, okay? Um, right, so I do believe that there is leniency there, right? But am I still breaking the law if it says 75? Absolutely. Yes. I'm still breaking the law, right? But I believe that there is a certain speed that you can go uh, before a police officer will pull you over and uh, give you a ticket. I don't know what that is because I am proud to say that I have not gotten a speeding ticket or any kind of ticket in the last 26 or 27 years of my life. And that. That's what, that's what I'm set to do. That. Okay? I'm excited about that. But if the law says 75 miles an hour and I go 76, Am I breaking the law? Yes. I'm breaking the law. So, um, but you probably won't get pulled over for it. So let me ask you this. We believe that there is some kind of leniency when it comes to a highway, right? I, I believe. But do you believe there is leniency when it comes to the Ten Commandments? Right? So like, is it okay to worship God and something else? Nope. Is it okay to have some kind of small idol in your house uh, that is not of God? No. It's not. So there is probably no leniency when it comes to the Ten Commandments, right? The breaking of the Ten Commandments. Now here we are in Exodus chapter 20. And we see that the Israelites, it is actually three months to the day that Israel has been freed from Egypt that have been walked away from, or Jesus, or the Lord has freed them from Egypt. And I want you to think about, in those three months, what all Israelites have seen. About two million people, okay? About two million people walked out of Exodus, or walked out of Egypt, because they were freed by God. And I want you to think about what they saw in these three months. When they left Egypt, God told them that they were going to receive gold and silver and fine linen and bulls, and the Egyptians were actually giving them the gold and silver. Can you imagine? You've been a slave for 400 years. Your ancestors for 400 years. You maybe grew up in this place, and you're and you're a, a slave. <coughs> and these people who slaved you are actually giving you gold and silver. What would you do? In his pocket, I got another pocket, right? Come here, son, hold out your shirt. Just put some stuff in there, right? And they're just giving it to him. So here they are, they're receiving the Egyptians well. As they are walking away, God protects them by this thick cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night to protect them, okay? Then they come to the Jordan River, 
God opens the Jordan River. They walk across the Jordan River on dry ground. The Egyptians, the Pharaoh is chasing them and they get in there and Galore closes the, the water. The Pharaoh and his men drown. They continue on their walk. They receive drinking water from a rock. They start to get hungry. Manna from heaven comes down. It is, I believe that the manna from heaven, I believe that Texas Roadhouse rolls are actually manna from heaven. I believe that Texas Roadhouse got the, the recipe from God. And that butter is too amazing. <laughs> if they had deodorant in that, I would wear it. <laughs> right? It was amazing. Right? So men are from heaven. God is taking care of them. God, all the way up to this point, three months to the day, God has taken care of them up to this point. Now you've got to understand that these, these Israelites along the way are complaining now. They're complaining, right? They're like, they see that the Pharaoh's chasing them, and they're like, why? You just sent us out here to this desert, so we're going to die. I'd rather go back and live in Egypt, where I was a slave. At least I know I was taken care of. <clears throat> what are we going to do? <clears throat> what are we going to drink? We are thirsty. Boom, water from a rock. What are we going to do? We're hungry. Boom, manna from heaven. I would love to live in that point right now, knowing what I know now. I would love to. I'm just... Get a glass of water just hanging out by the rock. Man, it's like 7 Eleven. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's amazing stuff. Okay? So now here they are, they're camped out. They're camped out at, uh, at, at the desert of Sinai, and, and, and they're camped at the bottom, at the base of the mountain. I want you to picture what they're seeing, okay? Moses has gone up to the mountain. God's glory is resting on the top of the mountain. They see all of this. Okay? They are seeing all of it. Aaron and the people, right? Moses' brother, Aaron and his people are waiting at the bottom of the mountain. They see all of this, and they're waiting. They're waiting for Moses to come down to give them instruction. What are we going to do? What's our next step? You got to understand that Moses was meeting with God on top of the mountain for 40 days. He's up there for 40 days, and God has a message with him. And uh, this message is the Ten Commandments. They're, they're He's bringing down the Ten Commandments. But the question is, is, what's the purpose of the Ten Commandments? What's the purpose of it? The purpose of the Ten Commandments was designed, they were designed to lead Israel to a life of practice, practical holiness. And I believe today that the Ten Commandments are a, a, uh, a guide or designed to lead us to a life of practical holiness. Do you agree? Do you agree? Amen. Yes. Amen. Church, come on. You know you got to talk to me. This is how we work, okay? So let's check it out. Let's break down these, these first two commandments, okay? Let's check it out. In, in verse 3, let's put it up on the screen. It says, do not have. Say, do not have. Do not have. Do not have other gods besides me. The Israelites, listen, the Israelites had just come from Egypt. And Egypt is a land of many idols and many gods. Many idols and many gods, and the Israelites have adapted to their uh, to the Israel or the Egyptians' customs, and they have accepted their many gods. And it was common to worship many gods in order to get the maximum number of blessings. If you want all the blessings, you will serve and worship all these gods. And Israel did that; they served and worshipped all these gods. Why? Because it's all they've known for four hundred years. That's all they've known. So when God told his people to worship and believe in him, that wasn't so hard for them because what's just another God to add to their list, right? Hey, let's put that, let's put that uh, verse 3 back up on the screen. Listen to what he says. But he says, do not have other gods besides me. <laughs> he is saying, all those gods that you have been worshiping, you can't have them. You can only have me. Me. Now this is difficult for them to accept. <coughs> this, is, this is difficult for the people to accept. Why is that? Because if they didn't learn 
that the God who led them out of Egypt was the only true God, they could not be his people, no matter how faithfully they kept the other nine commandments. If they didn't believe that he was the one true God, they couldn't follow the other nine commandments. Now, I want you to notice this too, that there is an implicit promise to the first commandment. Though you are not to have any other gods beside him, you are to have him. I'm going to rewind that so you can hear that, okay? Right? Though you are not to have any other gods besides him, you are to have him. False gods can do absolutely nothing for you. Say nothing for me. They can do absolutely nothing for you. But the Lord is self-existing. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing and full of grace and mercy to help the weak and uh, unworthy sinner. He alone is able to save you from hell, to deliver you from crisis, and, uh, and bless his kingdom promises. You shall have, you do not have, do not have other gods besides me. Now, King Solomon gives us an example of what falling into the trap of a false god uh, with women uh, or with whom he, his wife served. Listen to this. King Solomon married, had 700 wives. They were princesses. He was married to 700 of them. That's nuts! Not only that, he had 300 concubines that he was married to. 1,000 women he was married to. Oh, too much for me. <laughs> Can you imagine how often he had to move the furniture? I don't like it. I don't like it here. It doesn't go there. I just, Can you imagine? A thousand. Okay? He had a thousand. And when he married them all, and, uh, and they became his wives, well, he accepted all their gods. Check this out in, in 1 Kings 11 through 4. So when Solomon was old, his wives served his heart away to follow other gods. He was not wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord his God, as his father David did. Solomon followed uh, Ashtoreth, the goddess of the uh, Sidonians, uh, and Melcom, the adherent daughter, or daughter, idol of the Ammonites. Let's go to the next one. Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight, and unlike his father, he did not remain loyal to the, to the Lord. At that time, Solomon built a high place for Chemos, the ad, uh, an horrid idol of Moab, and for Melcom, the ad horrid idol of the Ammonites on the hill across from Jerusalem. He did the same for all his foreign wives who were burning incense and offering sacrifices to their God. The Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Now let's look at these gods that he was they were building altars to in uh, everything. So if we look at this Ashtoreth, Ashtoreth was a, uh, a goddess that symbolized reproductive power. If you got a thousand wives, I don't think you're gonna have that problem. Okay, so Ashtoreth was the goddess that symbolized reproductive power, right? It is a mistress of the god of Baal or Baal. Now Milcom was a national god of the Ammonites called this, this uh, false god was uh, was called detestable because its worship rites included child sacrifices. Chimbos was the uh, Moabite uh, national god. The Israelites were warned against worshiping all other gods in general and Milcom in particular, right, because of sacrifice of children. Now I tell you, serving those gods, worshiping those gods, that's a mess. Wouldn't you agree? It's a mess. Come on, church. Wouldn't you agree? Amen. It's yeah. almost chaotic, isn't it? I've got to serve this God for reproductive. I've got to serve this God, but I've got to sacrifice all the children that this God gave me so that I can worship this God. And this God wants me to worship that God, and that God comes off of this God. And it's almost like the Kevin Bacon kind of thing, right? Right? And just finding everything else, what's going on here. It seems like a chaotic mess. And Israel's involved in this. But listen to what Jesus does. Jesus backs this command up 
and he reminds Satan about it. Remember, Jesus is in the wilderness, and, and the Satan, Satan comes in and tries to tempt him. Listen to what Jesus says. And Jesus says, go away, Satan. Listen, sometimes in your life, you just need to tell Satan to go away. Come on, church. Sometimes Satan's just in your life and mess around, and you just need to tell him to go away. Can I tell you something? You have the power to tell Satan to go away. Why? Because 1 John 4, 4 says, greater is he who is in me than he is in the world. Maybe it's time that we start telling Satan to take a step. Maybe you need to start telling Satan to take a step away from you, from your family, from your job, from your house, from your dog, from your food, whatever. Get away from me, Satan, right? And when I talk to Satan, I talk to Satan like this. Because he's down, I step on him, okay? That's what it is, okay? Don't get me stuck. We're getting off track, okay? So then Jesus says, go away, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him and serve only him. We need to worship God and serve him only. You don't need all these other gods. Listen to what Deuteronomy 6.13 says. It says this, fear the Lord your God and what? <laughs> Come on, church. Fear the Lord your God and and take your oaths in his name. So what or who have you put in front of God in your life? What has your attention most right now? What is your false God? Could it be social media? Is social media your false God? Is your phone? How about television? Come on, you guys are not talking because you're just like, he's in the button. <laughs> what about television? What about sports teams? Can they become a god? Yeah. yeah? What about the athletes? What about actors and actresses? Yeah? What about pastors? What about TikTok? Can that be your God? I don't know. I've never, I don't know what TikTok is all about. I don't have TikTok unless it's on my wall. Yeah. So sing for a minute. Yeah. TikTok. TikTok. It's a clock. Yes. I have TikTok, right? But do we run the TikTok? Right. What about Instagram? Do we go to do we go to Snapchat, Instagram? You know what do we do? Do we go to that? And do, are we following these people and 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 uh, following their social media accounts? And we are giving advice. Oh, did you see? This is what TikTok said that we need to do. Did you see what Instagram needed to do? Man, I am so glad that we didn't have social media when I was growing up. Yeah, I was so glad that we didn't have that, right? Because I don't know if you remember the. But, couple of years ago, five years ago, the Tide Pod Challenge. You remember that? That is dumb, right? If, if you came to my school and you're like, hey, look at these, they have these Tide Pod things that your mom puts in the, in, the, in, the, in the wash machine. We should eat them. We would be like, you're a fool. Even the, even the, the kid who would, you would dare to do anything would be like, no. Mm -mm. I'm not doing that, right? But everybody's saying, hey, it's okay. We're all doing it. Hey, let's do it. Let's do it. Does that become your God? Right? What about, what, what about the one that where you, you, you choke yourself out until you pass out? People were dying because of that. Kids were dying that elementary and junior high and high school. They were doing that. Listen, I got your attention, teenagers. Listen, if you see something on Instagram or something on TikTok that's going to cause harm to your body, don't do it. It's... It's the devil. Tell the devil to go away. Right? Like the water more. It's of the devil. Just get it away. Right? You don't need to follow that stuff. You don't need to follow them. If you're following a certain person, they're making millions and millions of dollars for you to watch their, their, their page or their TikTok or their Instagram. They want you to do this so they can make some money. Why don't you just turn to this? If you want to change a generation, if you want to change the way things are going in your, with your friends and stuff, dive into that. But if you're saying, hey, you know what, I just, I don't know why I get the Bible around. Well, guess what? They got it on your phone, man. Put the Bible on your phone. Right? Get into it. Let's get after it. Okay? 
Okay, now get off that soapbox, okay? What about political leaders? Can they become your false god? Yes. Aren't we just divided right now? Yeah. Man, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't matter, man. I mean, are you red or are you blue? Is, is that the matrix? I don't know, right? Are you taking the red pill? Or the blue pill? What are you going to do? Right? According to Jesus, he loves red, yellow, black, and white. That's who I'm going to go after. Right? And so are we going to follow political leaders? How about this? Do you turn to your horoscope? Horoscope. Do you turn to that? I'm a Gemini. I wonder what's going to happen for Geminis. How, how come I'm a Gemini? What is that? Did you know that's a constellation of the stars? Right? So that, that's what they all are. It's a constellation of the stars. Well, guess who created the stars? Guess who put them there? God. So I don't have to go to the horoscope. I can go here. God will tell me what's up. What about food? Can food become a, a god? Yep. Come on, right? Food. The pantry. The, who, who do you worship? I worship the pantry. Right? I love the pantry. I love everything that's in it. It's so good, right? You talk, Swiss cake rolls are my kryptonite. Right? That's just what it is. Video games. Can video games become your god? Yeah, absolutely. Right? Do I think that playing video games is wrong? Absolutely not. I think that you can play video games. For me, I don't play video games. Why don't I play video games? I think it's a waste of time. I think that I can do more in reality than I can in fitness. That's up to you, right? How about our jobs? Can our jobs become uh, our gods? Yes, no? Yeah. <laughs> Some of you are like, I hate my job. I don't want to my job. I can't stand it, right? What about money? Can money become a uh, false god? Yeah. Can we worship money? Yeah. Are we always wanting what the Joneses have, right? Don't we want to just move on up like the Jeffersons? Isn't that what we want to do? <laughs> can, can money become our god? The question is, is what has your attention besides God? What distracts you from hanging out with God? What causes you to spend more time away from the Lord? Is that your God? Could that be your God? My question would be, why would you rather serve anyone or anything else but Him? If there is ever anything in your life other than God that you look to or depend on as your source of well-being, satisfaction, or deliverance, then you are serving another God. So, if you get commandment one wrong, you're going to fail at obeying the rest of them. Say, there's only one God. There's only one God. Good. Let's look at the second commandment, right? Oh, okay, second commandment, we're almost done. <laughs> you guys are silly. All right, here we go. Second commandment. Do not make an idol for yourself, whether in the shape of anything in the heavens above, or on the earth below, or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow and worship to them, and do not serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children of their father's iniquity to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing faithful love to a thousand generations for those who love me and keep my commands. The definition of idol is this. An image or representation of a god used as an object of worship. If we go to an idol, we are looking to something other than God. Idols, no matter the physical form they take, can never connect heaven with earth. They can never offer aid. So the previous command told us not to have other gods. This one warns against approaching uh, the true God in the wrong way. Like making an idol is a, making an idol is attempting to create a visible representation of an invisible God. Any such attempt will always misrepresent him. No matter how beautiful the picture we might create to represent God, it is no substitute for reality. So if we look to an idol, we are looking to something other than God. Idols have Idols, no matter the physical form they take, can never connect heaven with earth. Amen? Amen? Right? They can never offer aid. So never bow down to them and never serve them. Here's an example. 
that I found in Exodus chapter 32. Now remember, the Israelites are at the base of the mountain. Moses is talking to God in his glory at the top of the mountain. Remember, Israelites saw everything for three months, saw everything of the one true God. And here they are, they're getting antsy. Check this out. Okay, now remember, picture in your mind, God in his glory, Moses their leader is talking to God, and he's talking to God, he's talking to the one true God, he's not talking to the Nash Torah, he's not talking to Milcom, he's not, he's not talking to these idols that we can see and touch and, and rub their belly and do all that stuff, we can't, we can't, he's, not, he's talking to the one true God, the one that had the fire and, and, and the cloud and, and, and the cup and go fountain from the rock and, and Texas Courthouse Bond, I mean, it was amazing, right, you can, the Israelites didn't want me there because I've been running around together. This is amazing! Woo! It's awesome! Right? And they're getting tired. And they're really kind of going back to their own ways. When the people saw that Moses delayed and coming down from the mountain, right? They're like, kids, are we almost there yet? Little as fun. Right? They gathered around Aaron and they said to him, Come, make gods for us who will go before us. Uh, from the land of Egypt. We don't know what has happened to them. And Aaron replied to them, take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, your, uh, your daughters, uh, and bring them to me. So all the people took off their gold rings, right, that were on their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, fashioned it with an engraving tool, and made it into the image of a calf. I thought that was strange. Why did he make it into an image of a calf? I came up with the cat. <laughs> Never mind. It's a bad joke. Bad joke. Bad joke. Right. Then, he, then they said, Israel, uh, then they said, Israel, these are your gods who brought you up uh, from the land of Egypt. Just leave this up here for just a moment. I want you to, this is Aaron, who made uh, a, a idol for all Israel to, to worship. They gave them the supplies to do it. They melted it down and, and they made a, a golden calf out of it. Listen to these words. These words are heartbroken, right? Then they said, right, because they know the one true God. They've seen everything, right? And so then they said, Israel, these are your gods who brought you up from the land of Egypt. How do you think that made God feel? Good, I'm glad you asked. He was angry about it. Right? Here they are at the bottom of the mountain. They see everything. They know everything. And they want Aaron to make them a golden calf out of the things that they have so that they can worship it and sacrifice to it, bow down to it. They want to go dancing around it. Aaron agreed to do it. He formed it for them. And God sees this while he's with Moses and he informs him, You're the people down there are making idols and they're worshiping him. And, it, and he became angry. And Moses comes down uh, with the commandments and he sees what's happening. And it's cool, man. If you read on, if you read on what's happening, Moses is like snaps, like a father just snaps. And he's like, what are you guys doing? Right? And he grabs this calf and he busts it. And he breaks it down. And he, and he, uh, he um, Sets it on fire, like melts it back down, and then he puts it out into this water, right? And it like crystallizes into the water, and then he makes the Israelites drink that water. That's deep, right? He's like, you will not worship any other God except for God who is up on this mountain right now, and he's not coming with you guys, right? And he tears it down. He breaks this idol in front of him, and he melts it down, and he crystallizes, and he makes the Israelites drink this water, right? It upsets God. It says he's a jealous God. What does that mean, a jealous God? What does that mean? It's like, it's like when God sees us uh, as, his, as his bride, right? And he wants us to worship him and love him only. So if we look at this, if we look at these idols and we see what's happening here, you should have no other idols. Uh, you should not worship any idols. Romans chapter 1, Paul Paul mentions images of birds and animals, right? And with that in mind, we, we might assume that we have no idolatry problem or, uh, yeah, idolatry problem uh, if we don't worship creatures or bow to statues. 
But it's important that the first idol in Paul's list is mortal man. Listen, coming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God. For the images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. They were, they were worshiping uh, idols that looked like man. They were worshiping mortal men, right? This is a warning that should, uh, that should you start thinking of a person as your primary source of blessing and contentment, you have made that person an idol. Listen to what else he says, right? Not all idols, however, are physical. Paul mentions several simple desires and calls these things idolatry as well. He says, therefore, put death to what belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil, desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Just keep that open for just a minute. I want to read that to you again. Therefore, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, right? We're talking about the idols in your mind. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil, desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Right? A person who seeks to satisfy one of these, uh, one of those desires, they often will do it. And sacrifice anything to serve his or her idol. Sexual immorality, impurity. Right? The Bible tells us that if we if we were lust, if we were to lust after someone besides our spouse, haven't we already committed adultery? Right? And isn't there an issue with that? Because sometimes if you act on it and you follow it and you keep doing it, next thing you know that you are not with your spouse, and you're tearing your house down, you're tearing your home down, you're tearing your spouse down, till you're tearing your children down. It's idolatry, right? And Jesus speaks about this as well in Luke 16, 13. Let's put that up there. He says, No servant can serve two masters. Since either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. Listen, you cannot serve both God and one. When my father was alive, my father was my hero. My father was my go-to guy. My dad was a lover and follower of Jesus. My dad was a mechanic, a car mechanic by trade. That's all I remember him as growing up. But when he hit the age of 44, he decided to get into seminary. And he went to the seminary. And I was very proud of him. My family was super stoked for him. He went to seminary uh, and graduated, took on churches, and became pastor. He was amazing. Now, during this time, I, too, was a minister. I, I was a youth pastor, and uh, it was my very first time being into the ministry. It was 2002, uh, and I'm stepping into the ministry, and just during this time, as God was speaking to my life, and he would give me visions and, and, and ideas, and, and he would show me some amazing things, and, and I was like, yeah, this is amazing. Oh, my gosh, God, yeah, we're going to do this. But i got to talk to my dad first. And I would run to my father, and I'd say, hey, Dad, what do you think about this idea? And he's like, oh, man, Jay, I think it's great. I think you should do it. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do it. Right? And then I would hang up the phone, or I'd walk out of his office, and I'd be like, hey, God, my dad said it's good, so now I'm going to do it. Right? I would always put my dad's plans, or my dad's ideas, or my dad's thoughts um, above God. Right? I would ask my dad uh, his opinion about everything, and then I would just move on. Then in 2008, my dad passed away unexpectedly, right? He was 55, right? I'm, I'm 50. I'm five years away from that. My dad just passed unexpectedly. My dad had cancer. It was horrible. And I remember just sitting there, just thinking, right? Like, I thought, do I want to stay in the ministry? Do, is, this what, is this what I'm going to do? And God's like, you know I want you in the ministry. I'm like, you're right. Um, and, but I always ran to my father. Now, my dad went into the hospital on Saturday. He died on Tuesday. That Saturday, he was going to come to my house and help us hang up a pantry door, right, uh, from scratch. I never did it. He was going to teach me how to do it. And I'm sitting outside of my mom's front yard, and I'm looking up at the stars, and I just said, God, I said, I'm going to come to you for everything. I'm going to come to you when I have issues, when I need to hang a door, whatever it is, I'm going to come to you for everything. And God said, it's about time. And I said, Right? <laughs> I was I was actually making my dad an idol. I was coming to my dad with skin on and say, Dad, what do you think? Right? I don't think it's wrong for you to go and seek counsel from wise people. I don't. But if you are constantly going to that person and if they said no and 
And you said no. But God says yes. There's an issue there. Right? There is one legitimate representation of God. And therefore only one legitimate means of accessing him. And we find it in John chapter 1. I'm talking about the word who became flesh. Right? Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is the image. Colossians 1.15 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. He is the only true representation of God. And listen to what Jesus told his disciples. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Verse 9 says, says The one who has seen me has seen my Father. We cannot approach God through an idol, but through Jesus Christ alone. Did you hear what I just said? Only through Jesus Christ. Say, there's only one God. There's only one God. So how do we get rid of these idols in our lives? If you are worshiping some idols, if you have some things that you have put in front of God, how do we get rid of them? It's really easy. Really easy. If you are uh, following someone on TikTok and has become your God, I want you to go to that app or whatever that is and hit delete. Unfollow. Unsubscribe. I want you to hit it, right? Maybe you got something going on, I want you to burn them down, okay? I want you, when things start to, to come over into your mind, like impure uh, thoughts, lust, <coughs> whatever, <clears throat> when those things come and hit you, I want you to turn those thoughts over to Jesus, right? You can be walking down the street, you can be doing whatever it is, and all of a sudden you just like, something hit you, just stop where you are. Say, Father, this is not of you. I know it's not of you. So Father, in Jesus' name, get that out of my mind right now. Right? Just do it. And then when, you, when you're when done, you're like, okay, so can I get a number five? Make that large. Uh, I don't care if you're at McDonald's. I don't care wherever you are. Man, stop it in Jesus' name. Right? Just pray it out and turn your focus over to him. Make him the one true God in your life. James 4, 7 through 8 says this. Therefore, submit to God. What does submit mean? Submit means to serve, to, to, to go under. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil. We already talked about that. And he will flee from you. If you resist the devil, oh, no, uh, uh, get away from me, devil. Right? Okay? Then if you draw near, he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. How many of you want God to draw near to you? How many of you want him? How many of you want to know what kind of gum he's got? Right? It says, <laughs> cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your heart. You double-minded. Right? How many of you want to submit to God? How many of you want to draw near to God? How many of you want the devil to flee from you? Then how about no more idols if we serve the one true God? Amen. How about we do that? Right? Let's go to the next one. Right? I'm almost done. Humble yourself. Holy spokes, that's off his name. Humble yourself. How many of you have ever been humbled before by your children and you didn't want them to know? Right? They kind of humbled you and you're just like, go to your room anyways. Right? Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God so that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your cares on him because he cares about you. Be sober-minded be alert. Your adversary, the devil, right? Be under God's hand. Let him protect you. Let him guide you. Submit to him, right? But your adversary, the devil, what is he doing? Come on, it's right there on the screen. I put it up there for you. What is he doing? He's prowling around like a roaring lion, right? Who's he looking for? Anyone. Us! Right? He's looking for anybody. He doesn't care how much money you have or how much money you don't have. He doesn't care what kind of job you have. He doesn't care how many children you have. He doesn't care how many children you don't have. He doesn't care what kind of car you drive. He doesn't care what color you are. He doesn't care how tall you are. He doesn't care how big you are. He's going after everybody. He's looking around like a hungry lion. He wants to take you out. He wants to take you down. But what does it say to do? Resist him. Resist him. Right? I've got a dog. Her name is Layla. I love Layla. Layla is old, blind, and deaf now. Well, she is, okay? 
And so and she used to be my prayer walking dog. But there were, like, she knows my commands, right? My commands were, let's go. And she would come, right? Now it's like, hey, look at the look at Woohoo! And she'll just look up and be like, who is that, right? <laughs> right? But here's the thing. Did you know that you can do that to the devil too? Right. Yes. You know that when the devil comes at you, did you know you can say, I didn't know. No. no. Because in Matthew chapter 28, it tells us that Jesus, right? He says, I have authority in heaven and in earth. Right? And Jesus lives inside of us. You got Jesus living inside of you? Therefore, you got the creator of heaven and earth. Right? And guess what? The devil has to bow down to him. Right? In Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1, it says, The evil run away even when no one's chasing them. But the righteous, however, stand their ground as boldly as lions. <clears throat> so when the devil comes knocking on your door, come on, knock on my door, right? When he comes knocking on your door, resist him and be firm in the faith, knowing that same kind of suffering are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world, right? It says that we are not all immune. Okay? Check this out. How are we, we going to break it up? Go to the next one. Uh, yep. For this reason, take up the full armor of God, so that you may be able to resist in the evil day, and have you prepared everything to what? Take your stand. To what? Take your stand. To what? Take your stand. It's like Gandalf kind of stuff. You know what I mean? You shall not pass. <laughs> the Lord of the Rings people. Yeah. It was two hands, wasn't it? You shall not pass, right? Come on, men. Come on, fathers, husbands. Don't you say that to the devil when he comes knocking on your door? You shall not pass. Do you do that? Come on. How about you mothers over your children? You shall not pass, right? I'm not talking about the kids coming to dinner. I'm talking about the devil coming knocking on your door. Right? The devil wants you to worship all those other gods. He wants you to worship your phone and your TikTok and your Instagram. He wants you to idolize those things. He wants you to think those things in your mind that Paul was talking about. And God says you shall have no other gods but me. And if God says only him, then guess what? It's only him. And if you 